Hello to everyone and welcome to the International Spy Museum's Secret History of History, Elizabeth Smith Friedman, The Woman All Spies Fear. I'm Shauna Oltmans, the Exhibitions and Programs Manager here at the Spy Museum in Washington, DC. Thank you all for joining us today. I am so delighted to say that we have Amy Butler Greenfield with us today to discuss her latest book, The Woman All Spies Fear, Codebreaker, Elizabeth Smith Friedman and Her Hidden Life. Amy is an award-winning historian and novelist and has given popular talks at Harvard University's Sackler Museum, the Los Angeles Public Library, and the UK intelligence agency, GCHQ. Now, we were lucky enough to have Amy with us about a year ago to discuss her book, A Perfect Red, which looked at the history of the red dye cochineal, which tied in nicely to our exhibit about economic espionage here at the museum. So Amy, thank you so much for joining us again. I am going to start today's program um, just by briefly sharing how, uh, how we talk about Elizabeth Smith Friedman, the expert code breaker um, in the International Spy Museum. So where do we feature her? Well, in our codes gallery. Um, and she is there with her husband, William Friedman. And this is a photo of the display we have uh, in the gallery highlighting them and talking about the work they did as code breakers. And we actually have a couple of artifacts related to them, including a manual that uh, William wrote on secret writing, as well as these coded book plates that are from their personal library. And we also include that image there on the right is a reproduction of a Christmas card that's from the George C. Marshall Foundation. And the Freedmen sent this card in 1928. Of course, it's not your usual holiday card, but a telephoto cryptogram, which reveals different secret messages. So this is one of my favorite things to point out. But enough from me. Now, without further ado, I'm going to pass this on to Amy. Thank you so much for that introduction, Shana, and thank you to the Spy Museum for having me speak today. And thank you to all of you for joining us. As you've just heard, I'll be talking today about the codebreaker Elizabeth Smith Friedman. Uh, there will be plenty of photos, so let me share my screen with you so we can start that. In the course of her extraordinary career, Elizabeth Friedman tackled everything from Shakespeare to gangsters to Enigma machines. By the late 1930s, she was one of the most famous codebreakers in the world. Yet her success was hushed up, and later she was pushed into the shadows of history. For over half a century, she was almost completely forgotten. Recently, she has started to come into her own. She's been the subject of full-length biographies, a picture book, many articles, and an American experience documentary. More projects are in the works. So what is left to say? Quite a lot, as it turns out. Elizabeth Friedman was a woman of many secrets, and that secrecy has given rise to misconceptions about her life and work. At times, as I researched my book, I felt as if I were a code breaker myself, trying to crack the cryptic messages that she left behind. Often her story is told as a series of triumphs, and certainly she had many victories. But if you keep digging, you'll find an even more interesting tale, one that reveals the doubts, struggles, contradictions, and ultimately the resilience that lay behind her triumphs. So today I'm going to share some of what I learned about the hidden side of this woman who achieved so much. Elizabeth Smith was born in 1892. She was the ninth and last surviving child of John and Sophie Smith, who farmed just outside of Huntington, Indiana. She didn't like to talk much about her childhood, and this is one of the few images we have of her back then. She's the tiny girl in the front, sickly and small for her age. Her father was a domineering man, and he and Elizabeth didn't get along. 
Father Sofa is often portrayed as a shadowy figure with a limited outlook. But I found records that show that this simply isn't true. Like her daughter, Sofa had a curious mind. She had gone to one of the best academies in Indiana and she was once a school teacher. She was Elizabeth's champion. And she was almost certainly the reason why Elizabeth aimed at going to college, a rare ambition in those days. My mother encouraged me to go my own way, Elizabeth once said. This is the Smith farmhouse where Elizabeth spent most of her childhood. It's often said that she was raised as a Quaker. It makes a good story that Quaker turned code breaker, but this is a myth. Her family attended the local church of God, not Quaker meetings. What the Smith family did have were Quaker ancestors on her father's side. He was proud of this, and so was Elizabeth. She applied to Quaker colleges because she hoped this would win over her father, who didn't approve of higher education for women. Unfortunately, she didn't get in. When she graduated from high school, she told people she was college bound. In reality, she was stuck at home. Here's a photo of her taken around this time. For Elizabeth, this year at home was a lost year and she tried to make it disappear. For decades afterwards, she always subtracted exactly one year from her age, as if to say that this extra year at home didn't count. To make everything add up, she put a false birth year on official documents. Even her future husband wouldn't learn the truth until they had been married for many years. During that year at home, Elizabeth found the grit to apply to colleges again. This time she got into a non-Quaker one and she managed to persuade her father to lend her the money to go. He drove a hard bargain, demanding she pay back every penny at 6% interest. But to Elizabeth, it seemed a price worth paying. At college, she studied English, languages, and philosophy. In 1915, she earned her BA. She also became engaged to a younger student, a poet named Harold Van Kirk. While he continued his studies, she hoped to get a job in business, but she had no luck. Instead, she got a job in teaching because that was one of the only professions open to educated women. The pattern of her life seemed set, but not for long. That year, she discovered that she hated teaching. Then her relationship fell apart. Although she didn't know it, that last bit was a lucky break because Van Kirk turned out to be a nightmare for the women who did marry him. In 1916, however, the end of the relationship threw Elizabeth into deep despair. She feared she would spend her life all alone, chained to jobs she hated, marking papers and marking time. She wrote in her diary that she wished passionately day after day only to die. Desperate for a fresh start, she took a train to Chicago to search for another job in late May, 1916. After pounding the pavement, she stopped at the city's famous Newbery Library, which had a first folio, that is a first edition of Shakespeare's plays printed in 1623. She impressed a librarian there who made a phone call to a possible employer. Minutes later, a huge man with a bellowing voice strode in. Before Elizabeth knew what was happening, he had swept her out of the library. They boarded a train headed for a place called Riverbank. The man's name was George Fabian. You can see him standing here with Elizabeth. He was a millionaire and Riverbank was his estate about an hour from Chicago. It was also home to a one of a kind research center that Fabian himself had founded. His pet project was run by a woman named Elizabeth Wells Gallup. Gallup was studying the first folio and the variations in its letters. You can see examples of those subtle differences here. Gallup was convinced that these variations served a purpose, that they were a cipher carrying secret messages. She needed a new assistant and Elizabeth got the job. Here she is with Gallup and Gallup's sister, Kate. Elizabeth is on the left. Elizabeth loves Shakespeare and she loves learning more about codes and ciphers. She also enjoyed everyday life at Riverbank, which included swimming, fine dining, and late night joy rides and a fancy sports car. It was called a Stutz Bearcat. Yet no matter how hard she tried, she couldn't confirm any of the secret messages that Gallup claimed to have found. At first that made Elizabeth feel like a failure. And then she began to wonder. In 
if maybe Gallup was seeing messages that weren't really there. For a while, Elizabeth kept her doubts to herself. Fabian had a temper and he didn't like to be crossed and she couldn't afford to lose her job. After a while, however, she confided in another Riverbank employee, a young scientist named William Friedman. You can see him sitting next to her in this photo at Riverbank. Thanks to Elizabeth, William started taking an interest in cryptology. He also took an interest in Elizabeth. Both would turn out to be lifelong passions. In later years, when asked how he became a code breaker, William had a succinct reply, I was seduced. The more Elizabeth and William saw of the Shakespeare project, the more they became convinced it was nonsense. They were absolutely right about this. But when they finally told Fabian so, he was furious with them. Then he decided he had bigger fish to fry. He ordered them to set up a department of ciphers at Riverbank, and he offered their services to the army just as America was entering World War I. At that time, the United States had hardly any good code breakers. So Elizabeth and William ended up leading the country's main US-based code breaking unit. They were only in their mid twenties, but they were responsible for decrypting secret messages, not only for the army, but also the State Department, the Justice Department, the Navy, and even the post office. Later in the war, they also created the Army's main code breaking school, and they did all of this from Riverbank. Working as a team, Elizabeth and William spent hours together day after day. After a month or so of this, they eloped. Here they are on their wedding day, looking rather overwhelmed. There was strong family opposition to the match, chiefly on religious grounds. William's family was Jewish and hers was most definitely not. But they went ahead anyway, marrying in a Chicago synagogue. William had no regrets. He adored Elizabeth and he had declared himself as early as December 1916 when Elizabeth had a dangerous attack of appendicitis. For Elizabeth, the question was more complicated. She had seen too many women trapped in unhappy marriages. And after her devastating experience with Van Kirk, her college fiance, she didn't trust herself to love anyone again. So even though she considered William her dearest friend, marrying him was a gamble. It was only after the wedding that he won her heart. It helped that William truly wanted a marriage of equals, a very unusual idea at the time. He was even willing to do housework, which was extraordinarily unusual. It also helped that when they worked together, something magic happened. Attuned to each other to an almost spooky degree, they achieved things that others considered impossible. Amazingly, the two of them could crack almost any message within two hours. Elizabeth loved the moment when a solution emerged. The skeletons of words leap out and make you jump, she once wrote. But there was trouble on the horizon. The war that had brought them together was about to split them apart. In 1918, William was sent to France to serve as code breaker near the front lines. Here he is with Elizabeth just before he went overseas. Female code breakers weren't allowed to serve outside the US, so Elizabeth couldn't join him. Alone at Riverbank, she was harassed by Fabian, who also prevented her from getting a code breaking job elsewhere. Instead, he insisted that she return to the Shakespeare project. She took the only option left to her, and she went home to look after her widowed father. By the end of the war, William was seen by the army as a code breaking genius and he really was one. Soon he was writing papers that would transform the foundations of cryptology. Recently, it's been argued that Elizabeth was a secret co-author of many of these papers. There's strong evidence that she helped with the earliest ones, but it's also clear that the later and most remarkable papers, including a truly revolutionary work called The Index of Coincidence, came from William alone. But that shouldn't surprise us while William was in France wrestling with some of the world's most difficult codes, Elizabeth was back in Indiana, cooking and scrubbing floors for her father. <laughs>
There, as she later put it, she began to realize what it meant to be a champion swimmer stranded in the Sahara. By the end of the war, her co-breaking skills had atrophied and she was known mostly as William's wife. As you can see here, she was overjoyed when William came home from France in 1919. Yet when it came to code breaking, she knew she had fallen behind him. She did not see how she could ever catch up. It was, she wrote, an altogether hopeless prospect. At the end of 1920, the War Department offered them both jobs in Washington, DC, but Elizabeth was hired essentially as William's assistant for half the pay. After a year on the job, she quit. There's been speculation about why, but I found the answer on a scrap of legal pad buried in a pile of miscellaneous papers in her archive. She resigned, she wrote, in the hope of having a child. At the time, that's what many women did when they wanted children, if they were still working at all. But when the hope for a baby didn't materialize, Elizabeth took a job with the Navy only to fall ill almost immediately with severe morning sickness, the first sign of what would be a very complicated pregnancy. She had to give up the job, but she and the baby survived. Here's a photo of her with her husband and daughter. Over the next few years, she endured periods of ill health and had another baby. She undertook jobs she could do at home, some private code work and drafting a book on code breaking for teens. She was keeping a foot in the door. What pulled her back into full-time code breaking was prohibition, or to be more precise, the Coast Guard's battle to enforce it. Elizabeth wasn't anti-alcohol, but she believed the law was the law. And like many Americans, she was shocked by the links between rum running and organized crime. Gangsters had quickly taken over the rum running racket. And by 1924, some $500 million a year in illegal booze was entering the US. The profits made it easy to run rings around law enforcement. Violent crime soared. Outmanned and outgunned by the rum runners, the Coast Guard's only hope was to outsmart them by decrypting their radio messages. These revealed when and where the illegal cargoes were being transferred and landed. But the gang's radio networks were vast. This diagram from Elizabeth's archive shows how complicated they could be with many different vessels, channels, and code types. The Coast Guard knew it needed a top-notch cryptographer. They offered the job to Elizabeth because they believed her husband would help her with the work. They had no idea Elizabeth by herself was up to the job, but they soon learned. In just over three years, working almost entirely on her own, Elizabeth solved a staggering 12,000 secret messages for the Coast Guard and its allies. This gave the Coast Guard a big and new advantage. But the gangsters fought back by hiring some of the best photographers in the business at about four times Elizabeth's salary. By late 1930, Elizabeth estimated she had seen nearly 50 distinct systems of secret communication. She cracked them all, a remarkable feat only to see even more challenging ones take their place. Day after day, she was forced to grapple with them alone. It was demanding work. At times, it seemed nearly impossible, but it was the making of her. Just as her husband's skills had grown by leaps and bounds while he was overseas in France, Elizabeth's talents were now undergoing a similar transformation. Month by month, she honed her talents until she stood once more in the vanguard of the field. When the government started using her as an expert witness in rum runner trials, Elizabeth became famous. Here she is on her doorstep on her way to court in 1934. What really put her in the public eye was a case in which a lawyer for the Capone family repeatedly questioned her about her expertise. Finally, Elizabeth turned to the judge and said, Your Honor, is there a blackboard available to the court? When a blackboard was brought forward, Elizabeth gave everyone a lesson in the basics of cryptanalysis. To her surprise, the blackboard story set the press on fire. Articles about her appeared all over the country with bold headlines and photos 
And throughout the 1930s, the interest continued. Here's one of the many newspaper clippings she saved. After prohibition ended, crime bosses began to smuggle drugs instead of rum. Elizabeth kept up the chase. Her biggest code-breaking challenge came in 1937. It involved a set of secret messages that were seized from a Vancouver shop owned by a millionaire named Gordon Lim. The Canadian Mounties suspected Lim of drug smuggling, but they had no proof. When they couldn't crack the messages, they passed them to Elizabeth. The 17 messages were all very short and written in five letter combinations. The Mounties suspected the plain text, the original message was in Cantonese. By then, Elizabeth was in charge of a small team of code breakers. Together, they worked out that the messages belonged to four different systems. They even managed to break part of the encryption, turning the letters into numbers. They guessed too that the messages were meant to be used with a Chinese code book like this one. Then they got stuck and everyone but Elizabeth gave up. As she later wrote, she selected three messages, which for some intuitive reason, I believe might end with a character for reply. Her intuition had always been remarkable. And after a decade of breaking thousands of messages a year, it was now second to none. In those three messages, she spotted several patterns. She discussed them with the young Chinese linguist who questioned some of her results saying they made no sense in Cantonese. But Elizabeth had an idea. I asked her to speak the Chinese words together so that I could hear if the sound made sense to me, she later said. The syllables the linguist spoke were ix and chun. And to Elizabeth, they sounded like ikshun, the name of a vessel owned by a company that had been involved in drug trafficking before. Now she was sure she was on the right track. Soon she had all the messages cracked. They bloomed like flowers, she later said. They proved beyond doubt that Gordon Lim was guilty. After his trial in 1938, she made headlines all over the world. Here is a typical article which appeared in the Christian Science Monitor. And here is a rather more lurid one, how the G2 woman trapped the dope ring. Most accounts of Elizabeth will tell you that she hated publicity, but the truth is more complicated. She never approved of articles that messed with the facts or that commented on her appearance, but she often saved them anyway, as she did with this one. For many years, however, she was happy and sometimes eager to talk with responsible reporters. She appeared on radio. She told a publisher she wanted to write a memoir. She actively searched for co-authors who could help her write a book about her adventures. But the more publicity she actually got, the more she came to dislike it and the more difficulties it posed for her. Once World War II was on the horizon, her new top secret duties meant she had to go dark. So she did. And it was a relief in many ways. Here we see her on the job in 1940 when her work was under wraps. For many decades, the exact nature of her wartime work remained secret. It was known that in 1941, she created communication systems for Wild Bill Donovan's COI, which became the OSS, the precursor to the CIA. I've been able to prove that one of these systems involved a one-time pad, a method that properly used is unbreakable. The rest of her duties, however, were a mystery for a long time. Thanks to recently declassified documents, we now know exactly what she was up to. She was the lead cryptanalyst in the unit that monitored clandestine radio communications in the Americas with a special focus on Nazi spies in South America. One of her chief targets was this man, Johannes Siegfried Becker, codenamed Sargo. We tend to overlook South America in our histories of World War II, but at the time it was a headache for the allies. Not only was it rich in Nazi sympathizers, it was also rich in exactly the kind of resources that the Nazis needed. If the Nazis could establish air bases in South America, they could leapfrog their way up to the Panama Canal zone and seize control of it. 
At that point, it was feared their bombers would soon be in range of the United States itself. To some, these fears seemed overblown, but the prospect horrified the Roosevelt administration, and Elizabeth's unit was seen as a key part of America's secret defenses. At first, most of the South American spies used low-grade ciphers for the radio broadcast to their German handlers. That made them easy targets for someone with Elizabeth's experience. Later in the war, however, the Germans gave important spies like Sargo a present. Enigma, the cipher machines they believed were unbreakable. These machines were a type known as Enigma G or Abwehr Enigma. You can see one here. It was a medium security Enigma model, easier to solve than the highest grade ones by several magnitudes of difference. Like all Enigmas, however, it was no piece of cake. Armed with tips from British codebreakers, the masters of Enigma, Elizabeth and her team tackled the messages, solved them with pen and paper, and recovered the machine wiring, which helped with the solution of further messages. It's worth noting that the same work, often on the same messages, was also being done in the UK, also with pen and paper, and also largely by women. Yet Elizabeth's initiative impressed British officials. Some had hoped to bring her to the UK's code-breaking center at Bletchley, but other officials panicked. The ability to break Enigma was Britain's most critical secret, essential to winning the war. That secret would be blown if Elizabeth's Enigma decrypts fell into the wrong hands. The wrong hands that the Brits were chiefly worried about were those of the FBI, and for good reason. Earlier in the war, J. Edgar Hoover and his G-men had often demanded Elizabeth's help with code breaking. In public, they then took credit for that work. And at crucial points, the FBI had shared her decrypts inappropriately, alerting the Nazis to her work and scattering the spies whose network she was secretly milking. With a record like that, no wonder the Brits feared the FBI would blow the Enigma secret wide open. Luckily, the top brass on the US side had already decided that her unit no longer had to give decrypts to Hoover. That new policy helped keep the Enigma secret safe. Later on, after the South American spy networks were finally broken up, the FBI claimed the credit for breaking their codes. Papers all over the country covered this story and the FBI basked in unearned glory. Of course, it was really Elizabeth and her team who had done that work but they had been sworn to secrecy under the Espionage Act, so they couldn't set the record straight. In 1944, the FBI also claimed credit for the co-breaking in the doll woman spy case. This involved an American doll shop owner who wrote coded letters to her access handlers. It was Elizabeth who did most of the vital code breaking that allowed the spy to be convicted, but the FBI wasn't going to admit that. Again, Elizabeth was obliged by the Espionage Act and her own sense of honor to keep quiet about who had done the real work. She kept these wartime secrets all her life, and that's part of why she's not better known today. It's great to see Elizabeth at last getting credit for her war work, both what she did on her own and what she did as part of a team. You can see her here with one of those team members, Robert Gordon, whom she trained from the ground up. Yet even as we celebrate all she did in World War II, we shouldn't lose sight of how she herself felt about these years. For her, it was a time of frustration. In her view, she and her unit were not well deployed and their talents were often wasted. Why did she feel that way? Certainly it was exciting to work with Enigma, but that was only a small part of her job. And she knew that this work was often being duplicated by British codebreakers. The rest of the South American spy material was rarely a challenge for her top-notch team. She always believed that her unit could have been better used on what she called more important projects. What sort of important projects did she have in mind? After exploring this, my guess is that she was thinking of Japanese Navy codes. After all, she had already shown remarkable aptitude for breaking complex Asian language codes in the 1930s, 
when she cracked the Gordon Lim case, and she knew that Japanese Navy codes were of much greater strategic importance than the South American spy chatter. But Elizabeth didn't have the power to direct how her unit was used. In fact, she was no longer even the unit's official leader. When the US entered the war, a male officer had been put in charge of the unit over her head, even though he had less code-breaking experience than she did. When she requested that her unit be given more challenging and more critical missions, she was stonewalled. After the spy rings in South America were broken up in early 1944, she spent most of the rest of the war monitoring low-level communications that had little strategic value. After the war, her boss received six different honors and medals. Elizabeth received none. When the war ended, she recommended that her code-breaking unit be axed. It's clear from her papers that she was plapped in Vaughan. She then worked for the IMF for several years, creating their first secret communication systems, and she retired. One of the most poignant aspects of Elizabeth's long career was that she and her husband were often required to keep secrets from each other. At the very start of their career, they both worked for Riverbank, but from 1922 onward, they served different masters. William worked for the Army, while Elizabeth worked for the Coast Guard and Navy at a time when the Army and Navy were fierce rivals. Military officials often suspected the freedmen of spilling secrets to each other, but as Elizabeth herself put it, the rule she and William lived by was just never, never say anything. It was impossible, of course, to hide everything when Elizabeth saw a certain grim look on William's mouth she would know something had gone wrong. Likewise, she said, any expression on my face, he certainly could read. But they both did their best to forget what they saw. I tried to know as little as possible, Elizabeth later said. By the late 1930s, the stakes were so high that you just hoped and prayed you wouldn't have to know what you didn't want to know. This need for secrecy put a real strain on what was otherwise an extremely happy marriage. And one of the worst times began in 1939, when William was in charge of breaking purple, the Japanese diplomatic code, a seemingly impossible mission. Unable to sleep, he would go downstairs and pace back and forth for hour after hour. Elizabeth could hear him, but she knew she couldn't ask what the problem was. And he knew he couldn't tell her. In 1940, William's team broke purple, but afterward he had a nervous breakdown. He ended up at Walter Reed on a ward with up to 20 other men who were also battling mental illness. There was only one psychiatrist for them all, Elizabeth remembered painfully. Patients were urged to confide in each other. For William, burdened as he was with military secrets, that treatment was wildly inappropriate, but at Walter Reed, little else was available. After 11 long weeks, he was released. He was told he'd had an anxiety reaction due to overwork. Perhaps that was correct as far as it went, but it was not the end of the story. Later in life, he would be diagnosed with bipolar disorder, which had no effective treatment at the time. In 1941, when he came home from Walter Reed, it was simply left to William and Elizabeth to find their own way through. It's a testament to them both that they did so. William never tackled such high level code breaking again, but he was back at his desk in three months. He later became a top NSA advisor where he brokered some of the most critical intelligence agreements of the post-war era. His successes, however, were punctuated by periods of despair. During these low points, Elizabeth supported him, just as he had supported her during her own early times of despair, illness, and setbacks. Still deeply in love, they had always seen themselves as a team, each upholding the other. To them both, that was simply part of what love was for. If William's breakdowns marked the lowest points of their lives, one of the highlights was a cryptology project they pursued in retirement. After years of working separately and in secret, 
They joined forces to study the problem that had brought them together, Shakespeare and ciphers. They wrote a remarkable book that proved once and for all that there were no ciphers in the first folio. The book was a great success, winning them international acclaim. Here they are at one of their bookstore events. By this point, the Friedmans had been married for 40 years. They had been codebreakers for even longer, but they were still deeply in love with each other and with cryptology, and they were looking forward to writing more books together. Sadly, they had bargained without the NSA, which was unnerved by the book publicity that William was getting. NSA wanted its employees to keep a low profile, and by low, they meant invisible. So NSA started clamping down on William. At one point, the agency went so far as to raid the Freedman's personal library, a move that neither of them ever forgave. Elizabeth was outraged by the way NSA treated her husband. She was also afraid that the agency would never allow the full truth of his achievements to be made public. After his death in 1969, she devoted herself to ensuring that the record was set straight insofar as the Espionage Act allowed. She cataloged their library. She helped ensure his papers were preserved. She gave interviews. She didn't pay nearly as much attention to preserving her own story, but she did make sure her papers were saved too. These papers are now held at the Marshall Library in Lexington, Virginia in 22 gray archival boxes. Box 21 holds this gem, the diary she kept in her 20s. Biographers like me are thankful that these papers still exist. We're also grateful for all the government files that have been declassified and for all the photos she saved. These photos include this jewel from the 1950s. And just this week, the Marshall Library discovered still more photos, which are being cataloged now. We can only hope that even more buried treasure comes to light over the years, because it's thanks to this wealth of records that we are coming to understand more and more about Elizabeth Smith Friedman's hidden life and to appreciate the full scope of her staggering achievements. Thank you. I'm going to turn things back over to Shana, who's going to help with the Q&A. Amy, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. Um, your photos, as always, are just spectacular. They're so beautiful. And you are so, so skilled at um, telling a story in this compelling way. So thank you for sharing that with us. We already have a number of questions coming in. Um, I'm just going to start off, though, just with my own. Uh, in reading your book, you mentioned that as a kid, you were going through, it sounded like a bunch of boxes um, in your house that had been left there by the previous owners, and they had all these old readers' digests, and one of them was from 1937 and included the article, um, The Key Woman of the Tea Men, referring to the Treasury Department, and it was all about Elizabeth Smith Friedman. So is that, I was just wondering, what inspired you to write this book about her? Did you always, since you already had this taste um, from when you were a kid? Well, I was fascinated when I read that. It was up in our attic. We were very lucky. One family had lived there before we did, and they kept everything. And so there were these wonderful articles there. I was young enough at the time that I didn't say, why haven't I heard about her before? Because you're so young, you haven't heard about most things. Um, but I did look for um, books about her in the library and I didn't find anything, which struck me as odd. And I did go on to read all kinds of other books. In fact, I read about the doll woman case and um, told about the FBI and not a mention was there about Elizabeth Friedman. Um, and I didn't know at the time that that was a deliberate omission. Um, I went on to other projects. I think that desire to uncover lost history uh, was very strong. I became a historian. What made me start thinking about this seven or eight years ago was uh, my daughter, who was fascinated by code breaking. And we live less than an hour from Bletchley, so it's a great place to go. Um, there were other exhibits that we went to see in Oxford, a temporary exhibit. And we came out of that 
And my young daughter um, turned to me and said, just with this almost desperate look in her eye, were there any girl code breakers, Molly? And I thought, goodness, we need to tell these stories. So I said, yes, yes, there were. And I told her about Elizabeth and I said, I need to do something about this. And that's what made me commit to working on this. Oh, wonderful. So that actually ties into uh, one of the questions that came in, uh, which was asking, is it known whether Elizabeth's accomplishments influenced, influenced the Bletchley Park code breaking operations and those in other countries to hire women for cryptology work? Bletchley had already started hiring women um, before they had known um, much about Elizabeth at all. So they were independently, um, they were doing much of their hiring from Cambridge. It was people that they knew, graduate students, um, sometimes daughters of people that they knew. Um, so that was, that was how their hiring was working. In the United States, female co-breakers were being hired. And the person who was doing most of the hiring was actually Elizabeth's husband, William. He, of course, had a, a just a completely, um, I think, just a, a, a complete understanding that women could do this work too. And the only reason they weren't was because they weren't getting the jobs. In fact, the, the reason many of them weren't getting the jobs was you had to take exams to get these jobs. They were government jobs. You had to take the civil service exams. Um, and women were not encouraged to do that. Um, women, in fact, were not encouraged to major in the math and the sciences. It was thought that the jobs were not going to be there. So it became this self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, but there were some women who did this, who, who would take those exams and William would scour the list for them. Elizabeth had two when she was hiring um, back in 1931, when she was able to establish a unit she wanted very much to hire female code breakers, um, but there were no female names on the civil service list and she was not allowed to hire outside of that. So yes, indirectly that mattered. And we also know that one of the most important female code breakers on William's team was a woman who had been inspired by an article she'd read about Elizabeth. She hadn't realized women could be code breakers after that, she looked to see um, how did you train for this, found a Navy course, and from that ended up as a code breaker. And she spent all her life, she was working um, really right through, she was working on Russian material with Venona um, for many, many decades. And I just want to say, we are having a number of questions are coming in, but we're also just getting tons of wonderful comments from people um, thanking you for your wonderful presentation. Um, so. We're getting lots of positive feedback. Um, I do have a lot of questions here that are connected to their children, um, mm -hmm. uh, Barbara and John, uh, I believe. And so people are wondering, um, I'm getting a lot of questions about them, so I'll try to group them, group them together, but wondering, you know, were the, the children involved in this work at all? Did they, were they aware of it? Um, you know, what did they grow up to be having these code breakers as parents? Well, neither of them became code breakers. Um, their daughter, Barbara, was, um, she did many different things. Um, one of the things she was proudest of, and the family was proudest of, was she um, was a, a labor activist. She worked on a lot of important issues with equality. Um, their son um, was involved with film production. Um, so that was the direction he took. And there's a, a wonderful account that Elizabeth has of going to do a radio interview and she took both children with her. She wanted them to see what the studio was like. And I think that must have been John's first experience of seeing you know, what would really be his future line of work, this sort of big media studio with the production crews and all of that. Um, as far as what they thought of her work, um, they obviously were incredibly proud of her, um, but it was also a difficult thing. Um, we know that Barbara, I've worried about her quite a bit. Elizabeth had to travel a lot. She was away 
Um, I guess I should say, you know, there were, would be long periods where she wouldn't have to be away, but when she was away, they wouldn't know when she was sent off how long she would be gone. She might be gone for more than a month. She found that hard too. She said sometimes she had to kiss her children goodbye, not knowing when she would be back. And there were also dangers with the work. She faced the most dangers while she was working against the mob and against the drug smugglers. And we know that there was a point um, where she was provided with some bodyguards, um, but most of the time she did not have those. And yet it was covered in the papers where she lived and who she was. Uh, they would see her um, standing up in the witness box at court. And she was really exposed. And Elizabeth generally dealt with these things with a great deal of fatalism, and so did her husband. And Barbara remembered her parents joking about how um, her dad would say that the gangsters might come and take her mom for a ride, which she knew what that meant. And um, she was just terrified that maybe they would get her mother. Uh, they didn't. One of the things I've talked with her grandson has told me a story about how um, his mother remembered there being bodyguards at their house um, and they came and Elizabeth felt very strongly that she didn't want guns in the house, not with the children. Um, and so she wanted to feed them, but the condition was that they couldn't bring the guns in the house. So I don't know if they took turns exactly how they worked it out, um, but that was life with Elizabeth Friedman. She just took everything with a great deal of courage. She felt a uh, as it got into 1937-38, there was a point where she nearly gave up her job, which I explore in detail in the book. Um, but that was a point where I think that she wasn't afraid, but her sense of mortality was growing. Um, it was difficult work to do. Um, it, it required a great deal of resilience and courage. And then uh, we also have a question here. Uh, what prof professional relationship, if any, did Elizabeth have with Herbert Yardley? A very complicated one, I guess is one answer. Herbert Yardley uh, was the man who started MI8 during World War II, which was essentially the rival outfit, the army run outfit. Um, that would eventually take over most of Riverbank's work. What it also did was take over most of Riverbank's code solutions, but not give the Friedmans credit for that. So that was a story right there. William Friedman and Herbert Yard, they met up over in France. They didn't take to each other. William was a straight arrow um, and um, very friendly, but also very careful, very precise, very meticulous, and the soul of courtesy Yardley liked to live large, he drank, um, he had wild times with women. Uh, you can see they were oil and water. Um, but we also know that Yardley didn't care for Elizabeth. He wrote a note to William once uh, saying that his wife had an edge on her. And I think that's because Elizabeth didn't suffer fools. And she tended to see Yardley that way. And the two of them were proved right in the end. And they never worked very closely. They had a chance to work under him. And for complicated reasons, and they, they didn't take the job partly due to George Fabian, the millionaire, not releasing them. But I think also they were a little reluctant to work for Yardley. Um, and in the end, Yardley was disgraced having created a huge amount of trouble for the American code-breaking establishment. And I don't think they had any relations, uh, personal relations after that. Okay, and then um, I really love this question here. Um, what would you say was Elizabeth's single greatest cryptographic technical achievement? You know, I think a lot of people would answer Enigma and that was certainly a great achievement, but I, I have to say, I've looked at this in great detail and looked at the solutions, you know, worksheet by worksheet. And the initial solutions were um, helped along by the fact that the British gave tips and also by the fact that the German spies, um, their tradecraft wasn't that great. And their um, cryptological protocol was really shoddy. And so if you have a lot of mistakes, it makes it easier to find a way in. Later it got a bit more complicated and I think she and her team did superb work. Um, but 
I think, you know, if I had to pick one, I would actually go back a little further in time because if you want to look at Elizabeth doing solo work, that's part of why I went into detail about the Gordon Lynn case. I think that that was spectacular. There were just 70 messages, all of them short. Short is bad news. Um, if you're a cryptanalyst, there's not much to work with. And they were in different systems. And while she had the help of her unit for the first couple of stages of penetrating those, they really did, and with very good reason, say, we're never going to get into these. Um, it was that wonderful code-breaking instinct she had and the brilliance to say, what does it sound like? Um, that insight, um, which did come to her in part because she'd had an earlier case where the sound mattered, but that ability to see all these cases, have that experience and know what to apply in which situation. Um, I, I just look at that and I am in complete awe. That is really spectacular work. It really is uh, quite incredible what she was accomplishing. And that kind of leads into this next question I have here, which is, did Elizabeth have any formal training in mathematics or any other fields kind of when we think of related to kind of code breaking? But this is part of what is remarkable. Um, but it's also worth, um, you know, having talked about this with the National Cryptological Foundation and with, um, you know, NSA people, GCHQ historians, it's really important to remember even now working with code breaking, it requires different minds with different skills. That's how you break into messages. You need people with different brains and, and different ways in. That's really, really important. Um, however, um, it was absolutely true at this time in the 1920s and 30s. This is when cryptology is going from hand codes, uh, which are certainly systems, but it's going from hand codes to machine codes. And so the degree of difficulty, the, the need for analytical skills um, becomes ever greater. This is part of why William Friedman was making those breakthroughs. He had that mathematical background and that was important. It would become very important for Enigma um, later on as well that people had mathematical skills. But um, Elizabeth had incredible gifts at pattern recognition and she was also, um, able to look, you know, early on to see um, when she and William were working together, it was uh, in, in World War I, they were working back and forth, back and forth. So these two sides of the insights would evolve together. Later, um, as I said, he was working on papers, partly at France through insights. We also know um, in 1919, where she was just saying, I can't keep up. Um, but she then would read the papers. You know, she, she sometimes in the notes would be just making substantive things of, you know, maybe change the, set, uh, this, the, the way you say this, whereas he was writing the mathematics there, but she still, she was reading them. And then she was applying those techniques. That's part of how she became just so good at the, the work that she was doing at the Coast Guard. She was able to take those mathematical discoveries and apply them in addition to just her superb feeling for code, she, her husband would say that it's, you know, it sounds very weak to say oh, somebody just has an instinct, um, but he said, you know, that is, um, it, it, it's just indispensable in code breaking. And they would refer to it as the golden guess and that it's hard to explain exactly how somebody does it, um, but it is that pattern recognition is in itself a science too. Uh, and it was just incredibly important. And not many people have that gift. She had it in just spades. Wow. Um, I know you mentioned often that a lot of the work that she did, other people or other organizations are taking credit for it. So someone has a question. Um, in her lifetime, did Elizabeth ever receive any awards or honors from the US, the OSS, or other countries for all this work she did? No, I think is the short answer that she she did receive the publicity. And I think this is part of why her feeling about it was somewhat mixed. You know, she has been portrayed as someone who hated publicity, didn't want to be in the limelight, but she's not that way in the 1930s. I read through a lot of her correspondence, and there's a point where she's just um, 
just laying herself out to a publisher of just, I want to do this. I've done amazing things. She normally didn't talk like that, but she really, really, I think, craved some form of recognition for what she was doing. Um, and it is partly as she got older, um, it, she was just working as they, they came um, toward the war, both she and William were working on things that were incredibly secret, not a word could go out. And it became actually quite dangerous to talk to a reporter because even if she didn't say anything, they might lead to a conclusion and it might be close enough to the truth that it could cause real problems for her and for her husband. Um, and really for the country as well. If a country realizes you're working on their codes and ciphers, they might change them and then you have to start from uh, the beginning. But I do think later on in life too, we, we see that her, her interest is she wanted someone to write a biography and they couldn't find anybody to take on the job. And I, I think that's such a shame, um, but she also put together this collection. She left a collection that allows us to tell her story and she didn't, you know, many people might have weeded out the things that maybe weren't quite so complimentary or showed when uh, they really were having um, great difficulties or, um, you know, there's, there's feelings of just never catching up. Um, she didn't, she left so much in there. So we really can see, you know, what that progress was. We can see those periods of despair. We can see the periods where um, she really was struggling. Um, and I think that's a wonderful gift. I think it's really important for us to not see just the triumphs, but to see the whole story, the whole person. Well, we are just about out of time. There are still so many questions here. I apologize, we cannot get to all of them. We've had We've had so many. There's a lot of interest in this topic. Um, Amy, thank you. That was wonderful. This is the book. It is just beautiful. Um, and it is such a joy to read. So we highly recommend that you can get it at our store at the Spy Museum. Um, but Amy, thank you so much for being here with us today and sharing the incredible story of, of Elizabeth Smith Friedman. Um, do you have any final words? Um, you want to say? I simply wanted to say um, it's, it's been a great pleasure to talk and for me it really is a joy um, to be able to help bring the spotlight um, back to this woman um, who has been unsung um, but who really is um, an absolute hero um, and um, I hope that more and more comes to light um, and we can continue to celebrate her. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Uh, and thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Our next program is Spy Chat with our executive director, Chris Costa, and his special guest this month is Frank uh, Figliuzzi, who's the former assistant director for counterintelligence at the FBI. That program will be tomorrow at noon. So please visit our website if you'd like to sign up for that and any of our future programs. And as always, if you're enjoying these programs, please consider making a donation to our Mission Resilience Campaign. And again, thank you, Amy, and thank you to all of you for joining us today. We hope to see you again soon. Mm -hmm.